now continue our Chapter 8 lecture by reminding you of something I've taught you in the past, the definition of electronegativity. So what is electronegativity? Electronegativity is an element's thirst for electrons. The more an element wants to steal electrons to feel like a noble gas, that is, to gain a full octet, the more electronegative it is. As you should already know, electronegativity increases as you move up and to the right on the periodic table. Note that noble gases are excluded. Because they already have a full octet, they don't have a thirst for more electrons. Thus, the most electronegative element on the periodic table is fluorine, number 9, and the least electronegative is francium, number 87. This leads beautifully into talking about this very important subject, polarity. When two bonded atoms in a covalent molecule, that is a molecule in which there's a sharing of electrons, have an electronegativity difference between them, the more electronegative one will hog the electrons to itself like this. In this example, hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid, both of these elements are nonmetals. Thus, when they form a bond, it is a shared electron bond or a covalent bond. However, because the chlorine is much more electronegative than the hydrogen, it hogs the electrons more to itself, creating a partial negative charge on the chlorine atom and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen atom. Now this partial charge difference is called a dipole. Covalent molecules with dipoles are called polar molecules. The degree of uneven sharing of electrons between two atoms is called polarity. The greater the difference in electronegativity, the more polar a bond is. These three-dimensional pictures show charge distribution in three different molecules. Redder parts of the molecules have more electron density, that is, a greater partial negative charge, and bluer parts of the molecule have less electron density, that is, a greater positive charge. You'll notice that in the molecule F2, where both of the atoms, fluorines, are equally electronegative, there's a completely even sharing of electron density. In hydrofluoric acid, which is a covalent compound, the fluorine is much more electronegative than the hydrogen, and thus the majority of the electron density winds up on the fluorine side of the molecule, leaving a very strong partial positive charge on the hydrogen side. Now by comparison, lithium fluoride, which is a completely ionic compound in which the lithium atom has transferred its electrons completely to the fluoride, we have a more or less full-on negative charge on the fluoride side and a more or less full-on positive charge on the lithium cation side. Now we measure polarity this uneven sharing of electrons in units called debies. I've also heard them pronounced debies. I'm honestly not sure which of those is correct, but I prefer calling them debies. And the reason is because I like little debbie snack cakes. The greater the polarity, the larger the number of debies. We can say then that bonds with dipoles, that is an uneven sharing of electrons, have dipole moments. We can draw uneven electron sharing in two different ways. In one of them, we show this Greek symbol delta with a negative next to it, adjacent to the atom that has a strong partial negative charge, the more electronegative atom. And we draw the same symbol with a positive next to it, adjacent to the atom that is less electronegative and therefore has the more partial positive charge. Alternatively, we can just draw this symbol, a crossed arrow pointing toward the more electronegative atom, and thus the one that has the stronger negative partial charge. This brings us to this problem. I want you to arrange each of the following sets of bonds in order of increasing polarity. Now you're welcome to pause the video and attempt to do this on your own because I'm going to show you the answer to one of these examples momentarily. I'll go ahead and pick example A. We've got carbon bonded to fluorine, oxygen bonded to fluorine, and beryllium bonded to fluorine. Which of those has the most polar bond? Well, you'll note that beryllium is a metal and fluorine is a nonmetal. Thus, in a beryllium fluorine bond, the beryllium is more or less going to completely transfer its electron density to the fluorine, giving you a roughly full on positive charge on the beryllium and full on negative charge on the fluorine. This means that this will be not only the most polar bond in this set, but also completely ionic. Between oxygen fluorine and carbon fluorine, you'll note that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon because it's further to the right on the periodic table in the same row as carbon itself. 
What that means is there's a greater electronegativity difference between carbon and fluorine than there is between oxygen and fluorine. Thus, the carbon-fluorine bond will be more polar than the oxygen-fluorine bond. So once again, we have the least polar bond in this set being oxygen-fluorine, followed by carbon-fluorine, followed by the ionic bond, beryllium-fluorine. I'll let you do parts B and C on your own. We now arrive at this topic of bond enthalpy. Bond enthalpy is a measure of how strong a bond is. We can see that illustrated in this table. For example, a carbon-hydrogen bond, when it is combusted, gives off 413 kilojoules per mole per carbon-hydrogen bond. Similarly, a carbon-carbon single bond is worth 348 kilojoules per mole, while a carbon-carbon double bond is worth 614. Not surprisingly, a carbon-carbon triple bond goes up to 839. This table becomes the bread and butter of the ensuing problems that we'll do. Before getting to that, however, I want to show you some more theory. We can use bond enthalpies from the previous table to estimate overall reaction enthalpies of different reactions. All we have to do is figure out what kinds of bonds and how many of them are broken in the reaction, and what kinds of bonds are formed. Then we just do math to calculate the overall reaction enthalpy. For example, if we were asked to calculate the reaction enthalpy, which is often abbreviated as delta H sub Rxn for reaction, of the transformation shown here, we could summarize it as follows. In this transformation going from left to right, you'll notice that this hydrogen bonded to this carbon is ultimately being replaced with a chlorine bonded to the carbon. And this chlorine bonded to this chlorine is being replaced by a hydrogen bonded to a chlorine. We can thus say that going from left to right in this reaction, we break one mole of carbon-hydrogen single bonds and one mole of chlorine-chlorine bonds. As we go to the product side, we end up forming one mole of carbon-chlorine bonds and one mole of hydrogen-chlorine bonds. The full enthalpy of this reaction is then calculated by subtracting the combined enthalpies of the bonds formed from the combined enthalpies of the bonds broken according to this equation. For our previous example, that would be the sum of the enthalpies of a carbon-hydrogen bond and a chlorine-chlorine bond, and then subtracting from that the combined enthalpies of a carbon-chlorine bond and a hydrogen-chlorine bond. Using the table I showed you before, we can get those numbers as being the following, and determine that the overall delta H for this reaction is negative 104 kilojoules, which means that it's an exothermic reaction. We now arrive at some problems. Using table 8.4 that I showed you earlier, estimate the delta H for each of the following gas phase reactions. You're welcome to pause the video at this point and attempt to do some of these on your own, keeping in mind that I am going to do at least one of them for you momentarily. Here it is. I'm taking this molecule right here, which is called formaldehyde, which happens to be a compound used for preserving cadavers, and react it with hydrochloric acid to form this molecule over here. How in the world do I calculate the overall reaction enthalpy? Well, the way I'm going to do it is by drawing out the Lewis structures of all of the reactants and products. As I do that, I can see more clearly exactly what bonds there are being broken and what bonds there are being formed in this overall process. Now, rather than try and do extremely detailed accounting to be absolutely certain which bonds are broken and which ones are formed, you can still get the correct answer if you just say every single bond on the left side of the equation is broken and every single bond on the right side of the equation is formed. Here's how we do that. If we look at the overall bonds that we see on the left side of the equation, you'll notice that there are two carbon-hydrogen single bonds. You'll also notice that there's one carbon-oxygen double bond and one hydrogen-chlorine single bond. If I go to table 8.4, I can get values for all of those bonds as shown here. 413 kilojoules per mole per hydrogen carbon bond. I multiply that by 2 and get this overall number. And I get the other numbers indicated here. The overall value of all of the bonds shown on the left side of this equation is 2,056 kilojoules per mole total. Thus, in this process, if I broke all of those bonds, this is how much energy would be involved. I now go to the right side of the equation. Looking at my Lewis structure up here, you can see 
that the right set of equation, our product has three total hydrogen carbon single bonds, one carbon oxygen single bond, and one oxygen chlorine single bond. If I go back to our table from earlier, I can see the values in kilojoules per mole of each of those bonds. For instance, a hydrogen carbon single bond is worth 413 kilojoules per mole. Because there are three of them, those combined come to 1,239 kJs per mole. I then add the additional values shown here and come up with a total of 1,800 total kilojoules per mole of energy involved in forming the compound shown here on the right side of the equation. Now, in order to calculate the overall enthalpy of the entire reaction, what I do is I take the sum of all of the bonds that have been broken and subtract from that the sum of all of the bonds formed. All of the bonds broken, by the way, are all the bonds that we see on the left side of the equation. All of the bonds formed are the ones that we see on the right side of the equation. As we've already calculated those numbers, I can just throw them down here. 2056 minus 1800 gives me an overall delta H for this reaction of positive 256 kilojoules per mole, which means that this reaction is endothermic. All right, so that brings us to the end of this lecture video. Don't worry, there's going to be one more, which I hope you'll watch soon. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.